Let's take our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 11, verse 33, 34, 35, and 36. We'll give about two minutes each one of those, and we'll be out of here in about 20 minutes. You know, the old, uh, what was this commercial, the Hyundai commercial, where he came up and he said, this car goes 400 miles on a gallon of gas, and tires never wear out, engines doesn't hardly use any oil, and, and then a, a banner goes behind and says, he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to give attention to God's word today, don't we? This is a, another installment in the series, Prayers of St. Paul, Praise God for His Work of Redemption. And we're going to be reading, as I said, from Romans chapter 11, verse 36, uh, 33 through 36. If you stand with me as we honor God's Word. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, I praise you for this brief, but yet incredibly impactful text of Scripture. I'm amazed again and again by the Apostle Paul, Lord, by the kind of person he was, and by the kind of inspiration that poured upon him and through him. And I thank you, Father, that your spirit guided him. As he would say if he was here today, it was not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of God. And so, Lord, we thank you for this epistle that's been given to us. And I pray, Father, today as we look at this, that we will have a sense of the same greatness, power, and wonder of redemption. And we will see our role in it today. We bless you and thank you. For this congregation, I thank you, Lord. Thank you for the way you work in us, the way you're drawing us closer and closer to one another, the way you give us commonality through Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Father, for the church that is in fact, this manifestation, this place, this prism through which we can recognize the kingdom of God's existence. And though it's clouded in so many places, we see in the church the presence of a new world, a new system, a new kingdom, a new rulership. We thank you, Father, that you've established that through Jesus Christ. I pray today, Lord, that you will, as Elisha prayed for his servant, Help us to recognize that greater is he that's in us or with us than he is who with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. <clears throat> Throughout this epistle of Romans, Paul spent the first, these 11 chapters, outlining and illustrating and defending God's plan of salvation. I always find it interesting when people get new believers and they're giving counsel on what they're supposed to read first. And you know, I always think that the Gospel of John comes to mind, of course, what we always think. There we see Jesus' narratives and so forth. But I think and often Romans is a book that if a person wants to really understand what their faith is, what the Christian faith is. Start in the book of Romans and just read slowly and 
read verse by verse and think about what you're reading. And you'll see this amazing, incredible grace of God that's poured out upon this earth. And we'll see in that 11 chapters that God has closed the door. It's impossible for any person to please God. Any person to have a whole relationship with God or communion with God even. On the basis of his or her personal righteousness. It's hard to embrace. God has closed this door. He's made it clear that there's not access to him by thinking he's the man upstairs or the father upstairs or the good God or the merciful God or the one that you know will have tender mercies on us completely and ignore his just and his holy nature. There is no one righteous. No, not one. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says. And as God has closed the door, God has also opened a door. It's impossible for a person to please God and have a whole relationship with God and commune with God except through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the key. It's the door that's opened. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing how you have a fire in this room and someone says, there's the way out. Someone's not going to say, well, just a moment. I don't really think that's the way out. And, and secondly, who are you to tell me that that's the way out? Say, burn, baby, burn. I'm going out that door. If you're going to go out the door with me, let's go. I mean, it, <laughs> I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. No one comes to the Father except through me. In one other text, it says, For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And also, condemning sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of law might be met fully by those who receive Him. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. This door has been flung wide open. And Paul also outlines under the power of the Spirit that God has ended an old covenant relationship. The Jews, though they're historically God's people, cannot come into a relationship with God by keeping the law. Even though they're precious to God, and they have a historical relationship to God. They're called the apple of God's eye. Only belief in the saving work of Christ. His death. His burial. His resurrection. Confessing Him as Lord. And expressing belief in the resurrection. Of His resurrection from the dead. This is the pathway into a new covenant relationship. But that door has been closed. Gentiles can't come into relationship with God any more than Jews can come into relationship because by keeping the law. They're hopelessly lost under the wrath of God. That old covenant, if you think about the old covenant, old covenant is not a merciful covenant to Jewish people. The old covenant was a harsh covenant. It was a covenant that said, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And only redeeming blood of Bulls and lambs, animals, could bring atonement for a temporary atonement for sins. Hebrews says it's an endless, endless circular motion of sacrificial actions on the part of the Jewish people in order to come to a place of having just a momentary atonement of God. Though he has ended the old covenant relationship. He's initiated a new covenant relationship in the book of Romans. Exciting to see that through Christ's atoning death and victorious resurrection, both Jews and Gentiles 
can come into righteous relationship to God. But only, again, through belief in the saving work of Christ's death. Confessing Him as Lord and expressing belief in His resurrection from the dead. All these mercies were accomplished before we were even aware of them. That's a hard one. That's, that's the most incredible one of all. All before, not only were we aware of them, but before we even existed. As for you, Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you lived when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And God made you alive in Christ. This is an act of grace so that God alone can receive praise. So that God alone can be the one who receives praise because He is the only one who is worthy of praise. We struggle with that. We even struggle with that in the Christian context. You say that too much and clarify that too much and people get uncomfortable because then they start thinking God's some kind of an egomaniac in heaven that just needs to have all this attention. Who deserves attention? Rightly deserves attention, deserves honor, deserves esteem, deserves praise. God alone. And into this covenant only by grace can we enter. Only through the door of Jesus Christ. Paul, after articulating these things under the power of the Holy Spirit, articulating in so incredible, incredible forms. We studied through the book of Romans. I was looking at my notes and we studied through the book of Romans now about five years ago. Verse by verse, Paul now turns to offer a prayer of glorious thanks and praise to God for his work of redemption. I love the first word, don't you? What's the first word? Oh. <laughs> it kind of says it all. Oh. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's the cry of a human heart, isn't it? It's like the Psalms. As he will bring a song that says, Selah. Selah. It's, just, it's almost like the sound. People have a hard time. Well, it's very hard because it's un, almost uninterpretable what Selah means. It's a cry of the heart. It's an expression of almost exhaling making an expression toward God. Oh, when nothing else can express our inner thoughts, our inner thanks, we reach the depths of our intellectual capacities, the human heart cries, oh, oh. We come to the end of our depth. This is what he, it seems to be. He comes into his depth. We realize that God's depth, His height, His width, and His breath continue eternally and infinitely past us. From this place, perhaps a silent place, this expression that identifies His greatest attribute or His greatest praise toward God as He is fearful. And he's amazed. And he's humble. And he's surprised. And he's thankful. I talked last week about scratching the itch. We see Paul in these prayers, these prayers and thanks, trying to scratch this itch. How do I put in words my thankfulness for what God has done for us? How can I preach it? How can I share it in a way that it moves hearts? Away from the mundane, <clears throat> the hopeless, the unamazed, the arrogant, the passive, and the angry. Oh, he says, the depth of the rich.
riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, the depth of the riches. We looked a couple weeks ago about, in Ephesians, the riches. And Paul mentions riches again and again and again and again. They're consistently tied to Christ. They're tied to Christ. They're tied to what Christ has done for us. They're tied to the scriptures. They're tied to God's people. There's these riches that are around us. And he says there's a depth of the riches that are around us. I just don't think the world's getting better. I think the world's getting worse. I think it's really tragic. I think that there's evil that's rising. Terrible things are happening. I just don't see how... <laughs> Why do you think we're here? We're here to sustain that. Okay, so it gets bad. So it gets terrible. It's not nearly as terrible as it's been in many, many times throughout our history. We can concentrate on how terrible everything is. We kind of just sink back. Or we can say, no, I am here as an ambassador of Jesus Christ with a message of power and hope to, to share the riches of the wisdom and knowledge, the riches of his person, his character. Even in his passive attributes, when I say passive, you know what I mean? Before he does anything, just in who he is, just in his passive nature, his passive attributes, think of these things. He, he was called incomprehensible. His knowledge, his truthfulness, his goodness, his presence, his power, his holiness, his infinity. Where do we see those applied to anybody else? Listening the other day, and I heard this person who was saying that they're going to shoot a big, huge rocket. They're going to Mars. It'll take them three and a half years, I think, it is to get there. And they're going to land. They're going to set up a colony. And they're going to live there for a long, long time. And then it's going to have supplies delivered to them over time. He said, how much money do you have for this project? And he thought, well, we have, you know, billions. Well, how long is that going to last? I mean, you shoot one rocket off, you shut off, what, several billion dollars? I mean, think of it. Going to a place far, far away in order to try to discover something when it's right here under your nose. Oh, the depth of the riches. I don't like digging this gold out of this mine anymore. I want to go out in the desert, you know, someplace. And I want to set up shop out there and dig down and see if I can find water after about 100 years. You know, lost our way. I'm not talking about the world. That's the world's perspective. I'm talking about a Christian perspective. His goodness, his presence, his power. These riches are God's unmerited Gifts to us. He is our, he is our gift. They're unsearchable, he says. These riches, particularly the riches of his son. The deepest, bottomless supply of the riches of wisdom. Wisdom. This last time, didn't we? Sophia. Wisdom. Sophia. A philosophy. Truth. What is truth, Pilate says. As Jesus Christ is standing before him. And it's an equally vast supply of it. It's a vast supply of his knowledge. He says, of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge. And the riches are the wisdom and the riches are the knowledge of God. The knowledge is the highest knowledge. Paul used it in his text of Ephesians as all knowledge. That you will be filled with all knowledge. You think, oh, all knowledge. Okay, well, I hope I'm really, 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 really smart. And I really want a little more smart because after that, I really, really, really want to get smart. I really want to get smart. <laughs> Boy, talking about self centeredness God has more smarts. Well, he didn't have a finger. But, uh, you know, he, he passes our ideas of knowledge as, again, by 
inventing the vastness of his capacity for knowledge. And he knows this knowledge. And we recognize that he's saying the riches of the wisdom of Sophia, the truth, and the knowledge. And notice he says, of God. Of God. It's the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the highest philosophical understanding. The wisdom of God is the highest. It is the most complete. It is full. It's absolute. It doesn't have to be adjusted. Though it's tested, it's found true. Wisdom in its highest philosophical understanding and knowledge that is not from God. It's not knowledge about God. It's the very knowledge of God. That he says in his prayer here that we would have the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. Well, I can't hold all that. That's a lot for me to hold. That's not what he's saying. We don't have to hold anything. In fact, everything we hold is sinful. Everything I want to hold on to is sinful. It pleases me. It's for me. No. He's not saying that we're going to have the riches from God. We're not going to have the knowledge from God, the wisdom from God. We're going to have the very knowledge of God. We're going to have His disposition. His perspective. His understanding. And we reflect it to others. Paul's praise and prayer is that we will receive it, grasp it, and recognize that it's changing our thoughts. Is your mind being changed? If it's not, come closer to the Lord. Come closer to His Word. Come closer to His promises. Our reasoning is changing. Our view of the world changes from a source of our knowledge to a source of God's knowledge. His word, his thoughts become our thoughts. Know the thoughts that he brings. How unsearchable, he says. Notice his language. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgment and how unsearchable his paths. As we see that a compound sentence, we apply the first unsearchableness to both of the phrases that follow it. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unsearchable his paths. They're beyond understanding. His judgments are beyond understanding. I don't believe God did the right thing there. I don't think that should be the way it is. I don't think if there's God, He would let that happen. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think. God, God, God's wrong, God's wrong, God's wrong. <laughs> Who are you? Who are you to contend with God? It says in Romans chapter 9. Who are you to argue against your Creator? We've lost a sense of our creatureness, and as we saw, we've lost sense of the Creator. And the relationship to him has been lost. How unsearchable are his judgments. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. It's a great verse to remember. It's easy to remember. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God. But the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. The secret things belong to God. If God was to try to explain these things to us, we wouldn't understand it. We've experienced contradictions, haven't we? We've lost things. We've had things added to us that we didn't want. And we think in terms of how could this be, in anybody's judgment, could this have some kind of good? We see ourselves. As Paul speaks about, we, we see ourselves on a plane that's looking through a glass darkly. We look through a glass darkly, but then, he says, we'll see face to face. Now we know in part, but then we'll know even as we're known. Think of that. The things that we just don't quite understand, we have to patiently endure. We have to patiently wait we have to recognize that perhaps in this life we'll see, we'll understand. 
perhaps, without doubt, we will see it in the next. God's judgments are beyond tracing out. His paths are beyond tracing out. His paths, His will, His works, the thoughts that He thinks and the actions that He takes are beyond our ability to grasp. We often wonder why circumstances have unfolded in a certain way. Our trust is that though we can't find the answer, we surely know that there is an answer in the mind of God. One day we'll stand before our sovereign Lord and He will open our full understanding and reveal the glories of the divine actions of His will. The paths that He calls us to. Places where we find ourselves. Sometimes it's hard to trace back and find out how I got here. says, I stand amazed in the presence. I stand amazed in the presence. As we come into God's presence, as we recognize this is His world, this is His thoughts, His actions, we find ourselves humbled. We find ourselves, instead of ready to speak, we find ourselves ready to listen and observe and to experience all. Just really honest. I couldn't understand this if I had to. Who has known the mind of God, he says in verse 34. Or known the mind of the Lord. Or who has been his counselor? I perhaps think this is basically makes me telling you, you can't know God, you can't know, you can't know anything about him. He's way beyond you. You might as well just give up right now because it's not, not gonna happen. You're right. <laughs> There is that aspect to it. There is that incomprehensibleness of it. But we have a bridge. We have a person. We have Christ, who as the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him. The mind of, the, of God Himself is beyond our knowing. Isaiah 40, verse 13 and 14. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as a counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Who has known the mind of the Lord? More incredible than just the general conveyance of information or trying to understand information knowledge or wisdom is incredible understanding of redemption. Why would God, a holy God, why would He choose to have fellowship and relationship with us? Well, I can understand why, you know, I can't understand because I'm not smart enough. But why would he want to do that? What brings him glory in that? Well, you can say, well, of course, there's glory because, you know, we, we understand redemption. We kind of outline a few things. But think about it. Back up a little bit. What is the motivation to do that? It humbles us. Makes us aware of our humanness, our unworthiness. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who can fathom him? Or who has been his counselor? This is the one I like. There are, of course, some people who step forward and say, I will counsel the Lord. I'll tell him what I think. And we see celebrities that do this all the time. When I get to heaven, I got a few questions for the man upstairs. I wonder if we're ever going to get to heaven. Scripture says in Proverbs, to humans belong the paths of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All persons seem pure to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. When him, I mean himself. 
Commit to the Lord, whatever you do, and He will establish your paths. Job, if you've read the book of Job, how many people have read the book of Job? Anybody? Who read the book of Job? Most wonderful book in the world. <clears throat> Job made a powerful demand that God, because of his suffering, and with the premise that only the unrighteous suffer, only the unrighteous are poor, only the unrighteous are wicked and judged. And so as a result, Job, his family was nearly destroyed, his living was destroyed, and then his life was wrecked. And he found himself in a short time sitting before a fire without family, without children, without inheritance, his people that inherit his, inherit his, his life's work. And he found himself in front of a fire taking the ashes from the fire and rubbing them on the sores on his arms to give him some relief. And all the while he made the case, I have not sinned. And one by one, his counselors come to him and they progressively tell him, only sinners wind up like you. And he even went to the point of saying, let God come down and set up a tribunal and judge me fairly and it will be proven that I have not sinned. great chagrin. God did come down. And God did speak to him profoundly. Verses 38 through 41. Profoundly speaking of where were you, Job? Who are you to think that you can ask me to come and be judged by you? Who do you think you are to say, set up a tribunal and God's on the dock against a man? People say, well, if I was God, I wouldn't. I think, that kind of heretical talk just makes me cringe. You know, I've, I don't use that exact language, but I typically get to the same place. How could this be? Why is this the way it is? We can see those kinds of things. But who's been his counselor? God did speak to Job. And after he spoke, Job fell down before God in fearful humility and made this statement, this declaration. Then Job replied to the Lord. This is in Job chapter 42, verse 1 through 6. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is the record. Person after person after person after person all through history, in every generation. They contend with God and when God manifests Himself, they find themselves humbled. Grisham writes great novels. My son Daniel reads every single one of them within 15 minutes of their printing. He says, Dad, here's one, here's one, Dad, here's one, here's one. So I've read, you know, four or five of these novels. And he is very creative. But you know what? I don't really think he should have done it the way he did it. You know, I don't think he really should have done it that way. <laughs> well, here I am. <laughs> Best seller list. <laughs> kind of says, who do you think you are telling me how my novel should be? Who are you? It's very similar. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's who we serve. The author and perfecter of our faith. 
How did you come to Christ? By your own good pleasure? By your own pathway? By your own means? The way you liked it? The way you were comfortable? Is that how you came to Christ? Jesus said, the time, the kingdom of God has been advancing from the time of John the Baptist until now and has advanced. Come to me. I'll sing for you. I'll dance for you. I'll, you know, give you whatever you want. Please come. It comes violently, he says. And it brings violence upon us. I remember in my own life, felt pretty happy going nowhere. And then in a moment, in literally moments, God turned my entire life around and changed everything. The world seemed like a new place. Like, where did all this God-centeredness come from? When He awakened us through new birth. Is that your, your testimony? Did your life just get lots, lots better? Everything, nothing, nothing changed. You're always going in the right direction anyway. Stan tells me, he gives me his testimony and say. I used to be rich. I used to have a great business. I used to have a wonderful family, big cars, going long trips. It's now I'm a pastor. How do you get here? <laughs> Therefore I despise myself, repent of dust and ashes. 35, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? We need reparations for God, from God, because we were sinners. And we suffered as sinners, and so God owes us. Can you imagine that rationale? We suffered, and God now owes us. And He has to pay us for the sin and sinful years that we had, the disorientation, all the bad. He could have saved us a lot early, made things better quickly. But no, no, He let us go through all this stuff. He owes us. Never heard that before, did you? I, just, I think I just thought of that last night. <laughs> maybe, maybe someone else. I'm sure someone else has said it a hundred times, okay? But the idea of reparations for sinful life. Who has ever given God anything that he should repay him? I think that was at least in the mind of the Spirit. Paul's mind as he's writing this. God is the sum and source of all things. The very question of giving him something or repaying him is groundless chatter. He's our Lord and sovereign. We're his creatures, utterly dependent upon his bountiful resources for our very breath. It's not a very hard argument to win when someone says, No, I'm in charge of my life. I have a free will. I have choices. I can... Fashion my own life. I remember a dear pastor years ago went through this with me over a dinner table at a camp. And I said, okay, let's, let's do this. Why don't we do this? Why don't you go back to your room tonight and you really just, you fortify your argument. You tell me all the ways that you're independent. Tell me. I want you to be a big long list of how you're independent. And let's just don't, let's don't start with, you know, mind and emotion. Let's just start with our environment. Tell me how you're independent. Come back and we'll talk about that. He didn't want to talk to me the next day. He didn't want to talk to me. Because you realize that, you know, to talk to someone, you have to breathe air. But I don't know if that occurs to us. You have to, I'm not thinking about it today. I don't think, oh, that looks a little thin over there. It's come this way. It comes a, a no air cloud. Or I'm going to hold on to something, stand like this, so that I don't take off. Gravity, I mean, take a lot of gravity, get me off ground. But, you know, gravity. Gravity, I, I, well, I, I can I stand where I want to stand. I can go where I want to go. I can walk how I want to go. I'll talk to whoever I want to talk to. Yeah, well, you're still dependent on all those things. And the person who thinks they aren't is an absolute fool. We are utterly dependent on God's bountiful resources, even for our very breath. Job, poor Job, or wonderful Job, 
In the 41st chapter, through him all things were made, without him nothing, excuse me, that's not it. No one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Some of the Leviathan, this large sea creature that Job's never even heard of or seen. But he thinks he can give God counsel. It's just if God says, excuse me, Job, I, I really love you. I love you. And I want to answer you. I've got a, thing to, a couple things to do. I've got to feed all the animals in the world that are on high mountains and places you've never heard of. And he, and he introduces a thing called the Leviathan. It's a big fish. Maybe it's a whale. Maybe it's a dinosaur. I don't know. But it sure is big. And God says he feeds it. And Joel doesn't even know what it is. And guess what God feeds whales with? Big hunks of whale meat. Is that what he feels? Krill. He feeds billions and billions and trillions of krill. Just kind of swim around saying, eat me, eat me, eat me. In the big school. And the whales just. When's the last time I thought about that? You hungry? Where are you going to eat today? Who feeds you? Just a second. God said, I got to go feed the whales quail. Krill. Excuse me. It's cruel, right? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everything under heaven belongs to me. Everything under heaven belongs to me. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? And verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things. For of him, he is the first cause. All things come from him. He is the one, the only one, who has existence within himself. He is a statement of aseity, self-perpetuation, self-existence. Doesn't need someone else to come and help him. Doesn't need to regenerate someone who can regenerate him. He is the effective cause. The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. This is not just argument today. This is Paul's argument. Mars Hill. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. What an amazing sermon. And somewhat similar to today, he looked up himself enthralled by what he was saying. And everybody's kind of sitting there talking to each other. Who's next? Are we going to be able to talk today? Give us some more knowledge. Oh, that's good knowledge. Give us something else. We have something we haven't heard before. Well, the truth marches right past them. Because it's from him. All things come from him. And it's through him. He's the effective cause. All things take place through him. He's the fountainhead. From him is the he's the fountainhead from which all things come. You ever hiked up a mountain stream? It's pretty big at the bottom. Decide just to follow up the stream. Remember as a boy, we went to wilderness camp. Southern Baptist had great wilderness camps. And so he said, we're going to find the source of this stream today. Okay, well, so what's that got to do? We'll just walk a little path next to the stream until we find the beginning of it, right? You know, this thing went under bushes and went under rocks. We lost it for a while. We found it on the side of something. And way up in the top of this mountain, 
there's this little kind of trickling sound in the rock. And some kind of spring or something up there. And from the spring comes down this trickle into a larger river and spreads out. It's a great thing to do. You can still do it in the Appalachians and places like that. You can follow a stream until you find a source. And it's always up above you. It's marvelous. God is like that source. You see love here? Somehow. It came from Him. We see peace. We see here in some kind of person reflected, they come from him. We see power. They come from him. Mercy, kindness, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These fruits of God come from him. They're through him. They're from him. And they are to him. These things are the final cause. The final cause is found in Him. All things find resolution in Him. They make sense in Him. He is the one who is the beginning and the end. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23, and His incomparably great power, who is for us who believe, the power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked not only in the present age but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Remember taking writing courses and having the papers graded all through my life, and people don't like the word things in a paper. You ever had that? Well, the thing was, and the thing did, and they just go, try to use English language, not thing, stuff, something. Things, but he, he doesn't seem to be able to find the other words. And so he says, For of him and through him and to him are all things. Now, what about a thing? What's a thing? A thing is something. It's an idea, it's or a piece of material. It fills space, it fills thought. He says he's the sum, he's the substance of all things. All things were created for his good pleasure. And there is no such thing as nothing. Look at the argument. Nothing can only come. Nothing can only produce nothing. What's it? Ready? Nothing from nothing with nothing. Right? Yeah, you know this one. I don't know anything else with that, but I know that part. Nothing can only produce nothing. Well, nothing doesn't exist because God fills all things. There's no place where you have this, oh, it's nothing there. There's no idea that something was nothing once and now it's something. Because God fills all things. It may not have been in the form you see it now. He may have created it into a new form. But all that is, is in God. Where do you think an idea came from to create something that wasn't there before? You think there is an idea hanging out there in the universe that God doesn't know and is all knowingness? You think there's some material out there that God doesn't know about? I always love these discoveries when they, oh, we don't have very many, you know, the moon and maybe, I don't know how many planets we had gotten back from, I think just the moon, basically. And they have moon rocks. And guess what? There's nothing like this on earth. So the earth has nothing. And the moon has something. <laughs> there is no nothing. There's 
only God who fills all things. Do you believe that? You've been pressed by that argument? How could God create the earth out of nothing? Well, nothing is an idea you have. He creates it out of those things that were not beforehand what they are now. He is the one who is the source from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. What's glory? What's the word glory mean? Jesus said in the 17th chapter of John, just before he prayed his high priestly prayer, now is the time for the Son to be glorified. Oh, just tell me what you think that means. That's why what I just did. Glorified. Lifted up. To glorify is to lift up. And lift up for what purpose? Because we can see the one who's lifted the highest is the most supreme, the most glorious, the most worthy. I mean, you go to the Olympics and you got three stands, right? You got one stand for number three, and you got number two, and then the glorified one, number one. <laughs> we do it all the time. We lift people up all the time. Oh, I. Actress, athlete, never mind. Politician. They're getting harder and harder to lift up these days, aren't they? They're going to tear them down so much. The word glory is associated with being best, finest, the first, the most worthy. God is not trying to be the highest. Let us glorify Him as if we can lift Him up. No, our glorifying is to praise Him for His height, His greatness, His absolute unchallengeable power and glory and majesty. He's not just trying to be the highest. He is the highest. He's not trying to be worthy. He is worthy. He's not trying to be glorified. He is glorified. He is lifted up highest level and he calls our hearts to lift him up to that place as well so we're carrying our tongues of the day she said that she was someplace and by the way she's home suffering with some kind of ankle thing she has developed appreciate your prayers for her she was talking to someone and they she was at a, I think it was just a shower or something like that and she was someplace and she was sitting at a she went was, I think it was recently at the funeral. So she went back and she was went and sat down at the table after she got some food. She said, can I sit here? And um, she, she said, sure. They, two, two ladies said, sure, sit down here. So she just, well, one of them did. They basically told her to get away because the one was coming. But you, anyway, forget it. Okay, too much easier. <laughs> so she goes back and she's sitting there. In the, and she's eating these. And they really were good. If you were at the funeral for the Pearsons, for Skye, they, they was... Those, I mean, Ben, those are the greatest wings I ever ate. <laughs> really good. You, you should have been here, man. They were really good. Ben likes the flats. You know, <laughs> I don't like the flats. I just like bite those big. Forget it. Here we go. And so she says to her, she said, "Where did the food come from?" And she says, "We got it from," and she named some place. And Karen says, this would be great for us because we, we have, sometimes we have events where we need food. And we, this would really be great for us to have this contact. And the lady says, I'm an atheist. Karen's like, what? What, do I have a sign on me or something? I'm a Christian, I am angry. No. I'm an atheist, she says. So Karen's there, put back by it. And you say, well, okay, fine. You know, we'll be atheist, fine. I said, you know, I said to her, I said, you know what I say when people say they're an atheist? I love it. Want to hear? I say, well, you know, that's fine, but it doesn't stop God from being God. <laughs> Just because you're an atheist doesn't make God disappear. Oh, gone. Oh, oh, he's gone. I'm an atheist. Oh. <laughs> or if I say, I'm a Christian, it doesn't make him appear. He's already the highest. He's already glorified. He's already sustaining himself eternally. He's already the height and the depth and the 
breadth and the width of glory and honor and power and dominion forever and ever. Hallelujah. Everything that exists comes from Him. He's the fountainhead, the source of all things. Everything that has breath in it, He is the source of that life. Everything that lives and moves is a reflection of God's majestic, exclusive, completed person. As a result, he's worthy of glory forever. Say it with me. I mean, I can love the way the psalm says it. Forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Say it with me. Forever and ever and ever. You know what you're doing? You're just saying this with the angels right now. There's angels created beings say this eternally. Let's fly around the front. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Glory to Him forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. They want to. By the way, they're created beings. They have a will. They can do whatever they want, but it's not tainted by sin, so they do what they want, and that is to praise God. If you didn't have a tainted, well, you don't now, but if you had a tainted, a tainted uh, nature, you wouldn't want to glorify anybody except yourself. What's it called in addiction? Crabbing. You have a person who's just about to get free of addiction. Someone likes to come and crab them down. Pull them down like the crabs trying to get out of a crab box. You know why the crabs can't get out of a crab box in the, in the bay? Because the other crabs grab a hold of them and pull them back. All these selfish crabs. So here comes another new one. He tries to get them. Oh, no, you're not going anywhere. Get back down here. Your, your dinner. Get back down here. The world's crabbing. You're pulling down. Pulling down. You would find fault with God. Well, if God was... You don't understand. I don't understand. That doesn't make God not understand. God is our refuge. Psalms 46 verse 1 says. And strength. And ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. If people stop believing, if things look like they're getting really bad around here, if things look like they're impossible, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells, God is within her. There is a river. Oh my God. Whose streams make glad the city of God. What is that stream? What is the fountain? It is God himself. It is God himself. The holy place. What makes the holy place holy is the one who dwells there. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. God can do more in ten minutes than people can do in years. To him be glory forever and ever, Paul says. It's his amen to his song, to his prayer. Jews to express solemn ratification. It's like an expression of faith or a hearty approval, an assertion. This is what the amen is. Amen, he says. Amen. So be it. Amen. It is so. Amen. Yes. Amen. Ah. <laughs> it's the crescendo, it's the grand finale. Paul's praise. Lord, truly it is of you, and through you, and to you, are all things. To you, God, be the glory, forever. 